All right, now, keep your place here in Luke chapter 14 and just flip backwards really quick to Luke chapter number 9. What we'll be preaching about this afternoon is discipleship and following Christ. Now, I'm going to make it abundantly clear. The sermon isn't all about this, but before we even get started looking at the rest of these passages, it'll, it'll become abundantly clear, especially after reading Luke 14 at the end of the passage there, talking about, you know, you need to hate your parents, you need to do all this stuff in order to be my disciple. There are people out there, though, that teach that they get confused between discipleship and salvation. The two are, are completely different. They're not, they're not the same at all. Salvation is a completely free gift that is given to you. It has nothing to do with your works or your willingness to work or whatever you're going to do on your end to, to follow Jesus or to follow the Lord. There are many people today that teach a lordship salvation. You have to make Jesus the Lord of your life and you have to follow Jesus in order to be saved. I mean, how people say, I've heard this so many times, you know, well, it's a relationship with Christ that gets me saved. I say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we need to have a good relationship with him. I need to be, you know, reading the word, going to church, praying, do this stuff. Those are all works. Now, those are all things that you should be doing to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, being a disciple of Jesus Christ just means you're a follower of him. You are trying to follow his path, his lead. That's what a disciple is. There's disciples of all different types of people and things. A disciple is literally just someone who's a follower, someone who is following that path. That's what a disciple is. We don't need to follow the path of Jesus Christ in, in the literal walk of him healing people and preaching and doing all this stuff in order to be saved. That was given to us for free, as I already mentioned. But if you are going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to be a follower, and that is going to require a lot of work. And we're going to see what Jesus Christ said in many places and what the Bible says overall about being a disciple and following Jesus Christ and the cost of of being a disciple because there is a cost it's one thing to get saved many people get saved we go out soul winning we go out preaching the gospel we lead people to Christ so that they could receive that free gift and out of those people that that receive that free gift there's a much smaller percentage of those people that turn out to actually be disciples of Christ followers of Christ, people who actually take it upon themselves to say, you know what, now I'm going to try to do what's right. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to devote my time, my energy, my efforts. I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm going to go and do these things for the Lord to show my appreciation, to show my love, and, and just to be right with God. That's being a disciple. Now, um, and that, you know, we sang that song, and I know, you know, some people may be wondering, we say, is it all on the altar? I have no problem singing that song. I don't think that song is doctrinally incorrect because it's not talking about being saved. It's talking about having peace and having rest and yielding. It means allowing your body, allowing your soul to be led of the Spirit. If you do that, then you will have peace, then you will have rest, and you're offering up your sacrifices on the altar to the Lord. That's how you're going to have a happy, peaceful, blessed life by doing that. And that has to do with what we're, that's why we're saying it today, is this, it has to do with this sermon and being a disciple of Jesus Christ and being a follower of Jesus Christ has to do with you making the choice to make the sacrifices for the Lord, to do, to invest your time, to devote your time to, to, to following him, and, uh, and just doing what God would have you to do. Now, we're going to start off with the cost of being a disciple. We're going to get later on to some of the benefits of being a disciple because there are many benefits of following Christ and doing what he wants you to do. But before you even get started, we need to recognize the cost involved. You have to sit down and realize, look, if I'm going to do this, if I'm truly going to, from the heart, serve and honor the Lord and follow Jesus Christ and follow in his footsteps, you need to understand there is a cost associated with that. It's not free. It's not going to be easy like your salvation was. Salvation was free. Salvation is easy. But to be the follower, to be the disciple, to walk in those steps that Jesus walked in, to try to follow him as closely as possible, that comes at a cost. That is not easy. 
Look at Luke chapter 9, verse number 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now, that's a great attitude to have, is it not? Jesus is approached by someone and says, Hey, I'm with you. I'm with you all the way. Wherever you go, I'm with you. But people have a tendency to say things really quickly without fully thinking about them and, and realizing just the whole reality of the situation. So Jesus answers him. When someone says, hey, I'm going to, anywhere you go, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm right there with you. Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Now, he doesn't say, don't follow me. Of course Jesus wants him to follow him. But right off the bat, he's saying, hey, just understand this. If, you're gonna, if you truly want to follow me wherever I go, just realize you know, animals, they have homes, they have places set aside for them to go at night. He says, but I don't have a place to rest my head. I'm going to be going out, and I'm going to be preaching, and I'm going to be wandering, and we're just going to be out, and no, we're not going to go work and then go home at the end of the day. We're going out to work, and I don't know where we're sleeping tonight. I don't know where we're even spending the night. Do you really want to follow me? Now, I mean, just think about that today. Anyone can say, you know what, that, that would give you a little bit of pause. Even forget the example that this is Jesus Christ. Like, what if I were to come up to you and say, hey, man, I've got some really cool work to do. And I want you to help me out. Come follow me and we're going to go. And I, I, can't, I can't really tell you exactly where we're going. I don't know where we're going to stay. I don't know where we're going to eat. I don't know, you know, but just come, trust me, come follow me and we're going to go and do this thing. You'd be like, oh, I don't know. I think... Uh, <laughs> I think we need a better plan than that, right? Now, if you're just trusting me, I get it. I understand. I'd be the same way, right? I'm not going to be that, touching, that, that trusting or, or um, willing to do that. But with the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what he's asking us to do. So you're following me. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. There's going to be, you know, sacrifice made in order to follow me. Jesus Christ sacrificed all of his time. All of his energy, all of his efforts. What was it all about when he was here? We read throughout all the Gospels, everything that we read about Jesus Christ had nothing to do with himself or his personal life or anything that was about him. It was always, always, always about ministering to other people. His entire life was dedicated to be a sacrifice for us, for others. And that's where he's saying, hey, just, you, know, you want to follow me? Great, but just realize this. This is the way it's going to be. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. Verse number 59, he says, And he said unto another, Follow me. So now Jesus is commanding someone else, Hey, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus holds a very high standard to be his disciple. If you're going to be, and I don't have this in my notes, but you remember when uh, in, the, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, it says, um, and they called them Christians there first. The verse actually says they called the disciples Christians first in Antioch, that, that it was the disciples that are called Christian. Why? Because they're followers of Christ. That's why they, they got the name Christian. People overuse that term Christian to just be believer today, to, to, to are kind of interchangeable, but really a Christian is someone who's following Christ. That would be more applicable to a disciple of Christ, not just to a believer. A believer is a believer, and they're saved, praise God, but a Christian is someone who actually follows Christ. And um, he's saying, look, if you want to follow me, he's commanding people to follow him. But we can't have any excuses. Now, you look at these and say, well, that's not that unreasonable. Like, do you might say, well, let me go bury my father. Now, when he says bury my father, I don't think it means that his dad, like, literally just died and he's going to bury him. I think he's talking about maybe his dad's, like, kind of getting ready to die. He's like, well, just, you know, let me take care of this business first and I can go do this. And he says, you know what? Let the dead bury the dead, but you need to go preach the, go preach the, the gospel, preach the kingdom of God. 
And then the next man, he's like, well, let me go say goodbye. You know, I'm with you, but. And I think the point that he's making here is saying, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, there should be no but. It's not, I will follow thee, but I need to do something else first. Because what you're doing at that point is just saying, well, you're taking a second place. You're taking a back seat to whatever this other thing is that I want to do. And if you're truly going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't have anything coming before Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ says, follow me, I've got work for you to do, and you need to do it right now, then you need to do it right now. There is no, okay, well, I, I really want to follow you, but I need to do this, this, and this, and this first. And when we have that mindset of thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to get in church, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, you know, as soon as everything lines up, as soon as I get that new job, as soon as we move, as soon, you're probably never going to come. You're probably never going to get right. I mean, I hope, I hope people do. But there's an attitude that says, well, I need to do this, this, and this first. That automatically is kind of exempting you from being an actual follower of Jesus Christ, from being a disciple. Because you're not willing to make the sacrifice necessary to be the disciple. And if you're not willing to do it now, what makes you think you're going to be willing to do it later? Because once you get that one problem resolved, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be another problem that comes up. There's going to be something else. And it's going to turn into a habit of you putting everything else in front of, well, why I can't actually sacrifice and do something to be right with God, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need to make the decision, just say, no, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that's all there is to it. I'm going to follow. It doesn't matter how hard things get. I've already made up my mind that we're going to do this. I could, I'm not going to even use myself as an example. I could think of all these different things that have come up and been obstacles in my path. And I'm sure if you all think back of just, just different things that happened in your life, reasons why, there's so many reasons you could probably think of as to instances of why it's going to keep you from going to church, why it's going to keep you from going soul winning, why it's going to keep you from reading your Bible, what's going to keep you from praying, keep you from serving God. There's probably a million reasons. And as soon as you open up that door of just, well, I'm going to, uh, but, I, I want to follow you, God, but, then it could just be anything. And we see that same, a similar attitude. Look, go back to Luke chapter 14. I wasn't going to, I'm not going to reread this. We're going to start rereading this passage in verse number 25, but right before that, it's important to have all of this in context and understanding what the point that's being made. Right before where we're going to start reading, Jesus gives the story about the man that made a great supper. And he bade many people, and he said, you know, and all the people that he invited to that supper came up with an excuse. Oh, well, I want to go to your supper, but I want to do this, but I have this. Oh, give me an excuse. Just, just don't worry. Yeah, you're my friend. I love you, but yeah, I can't do it because fill in the blank. Obviously, this is, this is symbolic of the nation of Israel and how... You know, Jesus Christ came on his own, his own received him not. God was preparing a place for them, and they just rejected, oh, no, I've got this going on, I've got that going on. But that makes God angry. And we can see that from this parable. We can see that from this story. When, when people are just putting other things first. Well, yeah, you know, I want to do that, but it doesn't really work out. Well, I want to come to church on Sunday, but, you, I mean, there's a great big football game on. You know, I can't miss it. It's my team. You understand. We haven't been in the playoffs in like 30 years. I can't come to church. What are you kidding me? I'll go next week. Yeah, right. We can look at that and laugh. I can look at that and just laugh and be like, you fool. Because there's a lot of foolish things. Some game is taking precedence. But imagine how God actually feels about that. A game. A game. People are throwing a stupid ball around and running into an end zone. Yahoo! I made it all the way without someone tackling me to the ground. Who cares? Really, who cares? So many people need to wake up to that. I, I understand what it's like to get excited about games. I was in all that stuff, but now I can look at it and just go, what a bunch of foolishness. 
You want to play some games? Great. It's fun. I, I like playing the games too. But I mean, cheering and rooting and getting all worked up and excited over other people playing a game. And then you let that become your reason to not follow Christ. Do we see Christ saying, no, I'm not going to go and, you know, I can just go and do that tomorrow. I'm going to go heal those people. I'm going to go preach to the poor tomorrow because today there's this great, you know, there's this great uh, battle going on at the Colosseum. And, and I want to go, I want to go check that out. You don't see that happening. But let's look down here in Luke 14, look at verse number 25. Because there's a cost associated with following Christ. The Bible says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So now look at, get the context. There's people, great multitudes, a lot of people following Jesus. They're with him. At this time, at this particular moment in his ministry, there's a great amount of people that are kind of following him, want to hear him, want to know what's going on, listen to what he has to say. So he turns unto the people, and it's a great multitude. And this is, there, there's a lot to be learned just from the way that he's dealing with these people. Because any leader, any teacher that finds themselves with a great multitude of people around them is going to run into the thought that crosses their mind and the appeal to the flesh of maybe allowing themselves to be kind of puffed up. Wow, look, all these people are following me, you know, and, and the power and the influence that goes along with that. There's so many different choices that can be made in a situation like that. Where you could allow greed or temptation of just any kind to just, to just take over and start saying things that you know they're going to want to hear because you already got this great following. Now if I just keep on play into that following, I'll be set. I'll be in this position. Everyone's going to love me. That's the mindset of the Pharisee. That's not the mindset of Jesus Christ. And it's obvious because look at what he says to him. Verse number 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. He's got a bunch of people following him and saying, you know what? <laughs> you're, you're here right now. But if you really want to follow me, now, now you talk about hard preaching. You want to follow me? You have, you have to hate your parents. You have to hate your children. Now, obviously, He's proving a point. He's not literally meaning like, I hate you, I hate you, I, I, son, I hate you. That's not, that's not what he's saying here. The point is, nobody can come between you and Jesus Christ. You need to be willing to say, if I'm really going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it's all Jesus. My family's not going to pull me out from following Jesus Christ. Even my own son, even my own you know, daughter, my own brother, my father, my mother is not going to come in between. I'm not going to put Jesus in second place to anybody else. And when you have a great multitude, I think he's kind of thinning the flock a little bit just to see, hey, who's really going to be a follower of me? Because I've got a lot of people here right now. But are you really going to be a follower of Jesus Christ? We'll get into this in just a minute, but I go back to even thinking about our first Sunday here. We had a lot of people here on that first service. It's kind of thinned a little bit, though. Not a lot. It's a little bit. You know what? That's fine. I pray, I hope that people come back. People that might have been excited at the, at the beginning and end up coming back. But when you understand the cost and what's associated with it, you realize not everyone's cut out for this. And some people don't consider the cost up front. And this is what Jesus is always trying to get people to do. Oh, hey, I'm going to follow you. Well, just, just understand the cost. Just understand what it's all about before you try to jump all in. Because when you jump all in, before you really understand what you're getting into, and then you get out, you're going to look like a fool. 
Then you're going to shoot down your own credibility, your own testimony, when you're like, oh, when you become this person, and you probably all had experience with someone like this, that they get all involved in this religion, and then in that religion, and then in this religion, and they're all in it, and they're just, just they're constantly changing, and they're on shifting sands. That person is going to have a really hard time convincing anybody of what the truth is when they can't stay settled and grounded and just in something for the long haul. Now, let's keep reading here. So he's, he turns around and tells these people, look, you got to be able to hate your, your own mother, your wife, your children, and if you can't do that, then you can't be my disciple. Verse number 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And this, you know, this, by the way, this language should be evident that he's not talking about being saved. Bearing your cross, there's a little bit of work involved in that. I mean, that's the work that Jesus Christ did in order to save our souls. He's not saying that you have to sacrifice your, your body and shed your blood to, you know, to be saved because he already did that for us. But that is what he's saying. If you want to be my disciple, then you need to be willing to do all of that because then you're following in his footsteps. You're following his path and that's where his end was. He bear his burden. He bear his cross. If you're going to follow in Jesus' steps, then you need to be willing to do that too. Verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, so now he's going to make, he's giving this parable as an example, just a worldly example of just building a tower. Hey, I'm going to do this, build, this big work. Right? I'm, going to, I'm going to build this great tower. Well, you don't just, just make the decision, hey, I'm going to build a tower, and then just go out and start like, well, okay, let's start just laying bricks out. Right? without having to plan, without counting the cost. He explains this. He says, uh, verse 28, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. He's saying, you, you, you need to know what the total cost is going to be. Because a half-built tower is useless. It's not going to do anyone any good, and it's just going to make you look kind of stupid. Like, wow, this guy's a fool. He didn't even realize that, that he doesn't have enough money to, to finish it. I mean, why do you think people quote out jobs and everything? You know, you're getting an estimate of what the cost is going to be up front because you need to know if you can do it or not. I want to remodel my kitchen. Well, how much is all this going to cost? Oh, well, we don't have that much money. I don't want to start working on a kitchen getting remodeled and then have it just half complete. I want my old kitchen back that was complete without having some halfway done thing just because I ran out of money and I can't, I can't finish it. These are all examples that we could, we could think of and make a lot of sense to us. And he's relating that to following Jesus, to following Christ. So you really want to follow me, consider the cost. Don't get in it halfway and realize you're not really cut out for it. You're not really willing to make the sacrifice that you said you were all excited about and you wanted to make. No, consider that there's going to be costs involved. Consider that you might lose family members over this. Some of the most near and dear things to your heart might try to come in the way between you serving Jesus Christ. Realize that and understand that before you just go down this trail because you're going to be ashamed if you have to stop serving Jesus because there really is something else that you're not willing to, to have to sacrifice in order to continue your service to God. And then he gives another example of, uh, you know, going to war. You know, any king going to war is going to consider his own resources and what the other guys got, the other armies, and say, hey, am I going to be able to beat this, this king or not? And be in a good position instead of having to go out there and be like, oh, wait, I'm sorry, I, 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 we're going to surrender. Can we talk about peace treaty now? You know, it's, and then you're not going to be nearly in, in as good of a situation or whatever. So uh, verse number 33, there, jump down to verse number 33. It says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ comes at a high cost. He's saying you need to be willing to just sacrifice everything. Then you can be my disciple. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 4, because now we're going to start getting into some of the benefits. I'll just read for you from Acts 14, 22. The Bible says about Paul and uh, Barnabas going about, they're going to confirm the souls that they had won to Christ. It says, confirming the souls of the disciples 
and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So Paul and Barnabas are going around and, and exhorting the disciples, the people who are currently following Christ and, and people who are, who are faithful, they're doing the right thing, and just to exhort them, just to encourage them and remind them and say, hey, don't be discouraged. <laughs> we're going to enter the kingdom, but we're going to enter it through much tribulation. There's going to be a lot of problems. And that is another one of the reasons, as a side note, is why coming to church is so important. Because we're gathering around other like-minded people, other disciples, other people who understand we're going through the same thing. So we can encourage one another and say, hey, don't faint. Don't drop out. You need a little bit of encouragement. We'll build you up a little bit because, yeah, it's not easy. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be hard times. Let's keep going. Keep your eye on the mark. And we're in Mark. Mark chapter 4. Keep your eye on Mark chapter 4. Look at down at verse number 33. We're going to see an advantage of being a disciple of Christ. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. So when Jesus was preaching to the multitudes, and he had a lot of people following, he spake in parables. Always. He was always teaching just the masses in parables. But look what he did to his disciples. Verse number 34. But... Without a, but without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. You want to know and really know and get wisdom and get understanding from God's word, from the scripture, you need to be a disciple. You need to invest. You need to sacrifice. You need to be following in order to really understand God's word. Because until you do that, there's just so much you're not going to be able to understand. It's just going to be like a parable. I mean, he spake, spake with parables to the multitudes, but his disciples, he's really breaking it down and saying, see, this, you know, this is what the scripture means and getting it all in context and just getting the full understanding. And as a disciple, someone who's coming to church regularly, you're going to be getting fed a lot of that too. You're going to be receiving a lot of that coming to church. And hearing from someone else who's not a novice, someone who's experienced, someone who's been through a lot, helping to show you the scriptures and open that up for you. So if you go to John chapter 8, another benefit of being a disciple, being a follower, someone who is choosing to make the sacrifice and follow God's word without anything coming in between. John chapter 8, we're going to look at verse number 31. John 8, 31, the Bible reads, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. So there were... Plenty of Jews that did believe on Jesus Christ, and this is who he's targeting and he's speaking to directly. They just believed on him. He's saying, okay, now if you continue in my word, in my doctrine, what I'm teaching, if you can continue doing this, then you're, gonna be my, then you're actually going to be my disciples. Indeed, right? Meaning, like, in practice, not just in words, not just saying, oh, yeah, I follow Jesus. I mean, how many people say, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? And just in all the sins of the world... Yeah, you're a real follower of Jesus Christ. I could tell. They just throw that around. Be saying, no, if you could continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Verse number 32, and ye shall know the truth. Again, this ties in with what we just saw, that Jesus expounded all things to his disciples. Well, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, he says, then ye shall know the truth. You're working, your sacrifices, you're reading, you're going to church, you're hearing, teaching, then you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He's talking to people who are already believers. In the context here, you know, th uh, this verse is used, I don't know how many times about, you know, typically about people using this with salvation. Oh, the truth's going to make you free, right? You're free through the gospel. Great. Well, that's not what the context is actually saying here. Because they're already made free because they're believers. And if we keep reading, we're going to see even further, this is talking about them being free from bondage of sin and getting sin out of their life. And if you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to be hearing and receiving God's word more to open up your eyes. Wow, 
I'm not right with God here and here and here. And I need to get this out of my life. And the more you get this sin out of your life, the more free you are. You're not a slave to that bondage. Let's keep reading. Verse number 33. They answered him. But see, and this is where people make it a little bit confused. He's speaking directly to certain people who believe, but they're not the only people that are in this group. So other people are there as well, too, and they're starting to answer Jesus Christ, thinking that he's talking to them. But regardless of that, let's keep reading here. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. This is giving the context. saying, Well, this is what I'm talking about. You're being made free, not because I think you're some slave to another physical master that you're like, a, you know, a servant. But when you sin, you become a servant to that sin. Verse 35, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. When you become a disciple of Jesus and you continue in the word, and you, and you devote your time and efforts to following Jesus Christ, he will make you free from the bondage of sin and will help you to become more righteous and more conformed under the image of his son. That's what being a disciple will get you. It will get you down that path. It'll bring you into walking in the spirit more than walking in the flesh. And we know what the fruit of the spirit is. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, long-suffering, all those good attributes that you want to have in your life. All of that comes through walking in the Spirit. Well, if you're walking in the flesh, you're not walking in the Spirit. If you're committing sin, you're walking in the flesh. So let's get the sin out of our life. Let's get free from that bondage. We can be walking in the Spirit a lot more and receiving the benefit of being in the fruit and, and receiving the fruit of the Spirit. Flip back, if you would, just to John chapter 6. And this also ties in a little bit with some of the cost as well, but more, more to do now with once you decide to be a disciple, you need to continue as a disciple. We see the cost. We see some of the benefits. Those aren't all the benefits, but I mean, getting, getting free from bondage of sin, that's a pretty big plus. I know it isn't, <laughs> I know firsthand, that's a pretty big plus. When, when I've gotten victories over certain sins, man, how much that has just benefited and changed my life. I thank God for all of that. I'm so thankful now at this point in my life that like I'm not going out to bars and drinking. Yeah, at the time I thought it was real fun. I thought it was great. But when you get away from that stuff, you realize, wow, how horrible was that to my life, to my mind, to my spirit, to my body. I don't miss waking up with hangovers. I don't miss crouching down on the floor by a toilet and vomiting in filth. I don't miss that at all. Thank God the more you start to, to become a disciple, he'll help you get free from that bondage. That doesn't do any good in your life. But realize, as a disciple, we need to continue as a disciple. Disciples need to be able to endure hard preaching in order to continue as a disciple. Look at verse number 59. And this is, this is the famous passage, John chapter 6, when Jesus says, you know, I am the bread of life, and if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, then, then you're not saved. I'm, I'm giving you the, the, the summary. You read all of John chapter 6, and he, and he really just, just lays it out hard. I mean, he's, he's not treading lightly when he makes these statements. Just like he said to them, hey, you need to hate your father and mother. I mean, it sounds pretty extreme. That's the way Jesus preached. He's getting a point across. It's some hard preaching. He's not worried about people misunderstanding what he said, he's preaching them truth and he's preaching them what they need to hear. And if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to need to hear those things. You're going to need to hear it just spelled out, just black and white and just say, here we go. 
And this is one of the things he does in John chapter 6. Look at verse number 59. It says, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. He's preaching publicly. He's in church. He's in the synagogue preaching these things, saying that I'm the bread of life. Verse number 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Well, that's some hard preaching. His own disciples. Wow, that's, that's some pretty hard, hard preaching there. Who can hear it? But I, lo I love Jesus' response. Because unfortunately, we got people today that say, oh, no, you know, pastors, you need to, you, you, can't, you can't say things so hard. I mean, you can't say something that might offend somebody because then they're going to get out of church. And then, you know, and then what good have you done? And personally, as a pastor... I understand the mindset. I really do. But as a pastor, you need to overcome your own fleshly wisdom and rely on God's wisdom. And if we're going to follow example, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. Because that type of mindset is, going to, is why so many pastors don't preach on sin. They think, well... I'm going to scare them away. And then it was, they need to just be here and get strengthened and we can do whatever we can. To, you know. But if that means withholding, if that means censoring the message in any way, shape, or form, you're not doing what God told you to do. It's a bottom line. And we have the example of Jesus Christ himself not backing down, not saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys, I don't think you fully understood me. No, when I said that, he's not doing that. He's saying, okay, does this offend you? Look at verse number 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Oh, are you offended? You offended my preaching? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Now, I think he's saying this because they shouldn't be doubting anything that Jesus Christ is saying. He's the Son of God. Oh, you're going to be offended at my preaching? <laughs> what if you see me ascend up where I was before, is basically what he's saying. Then are you still going to be offended at what I have to say? And he, and he does explain, verse 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. Look at verse number 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Many disciples stopped following Jesus Christ because they were offended at the hard preaching. They to, can't do it. If you want to be a disciple... And continue as a disciple because they started following Jesus. You can't let the hard preaching knock you out of church. And I, I just over years and years of experience, you see it happen. Some many, oftentimes, the people you never think it would happen to, people could be coming to church. People will be coming to church for a year, and then one sermon's preached. Oh, I can't believe he said that. Oh, yeah, and they're out. I think a specific example where at Faithful Word Baptist Church, people would come faithfully, faithfully, faithfully. And then I, I think it was a sermon. And, and at the time, I didn't even realize because you think, you know, some people, they're coming faithfully, but they miss sometimes. And then it's like you're trying to figure out, well, what's the, why aren't they coming anymore? And I think it had to do with a sermon on like public education or Bible school or something like, you know, it's one of those types of sermons. It's like, it's not preached on all the time, but they could sit through all this other preaching and then it's like, well, there's this one subject that just offended them. Oh, I can't believe you, you know, and that got them out. Well, that's not how you're going to be a disciple. I mean, that's, if you're going to be offended at the preaching, and look, if someone preaches something that you don't agree with, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you can't just let that knock you out of church. You don't have to agree. And look, get this. You don't have to agree with every single thing, every single word that comes out of my mouth behind the pulpit to, to come to church and to be right with God. 
Now, you ought to believe everything that the Bible says. If I misapply something or teach something that you don't, you think that I'm wrong on that, okay. Yeah, I could be wrong. But don't let that offend you to get out of Now, obviously, Jesus Christ was not wrong about anything. And he's just like, fine, you're offended. See ya. Because he even turns around and look what he does to his, to his disciples. He says, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you, go, will you also go away? He has the attitude of, I'm going to preach the truth. And even if nobody's following me, I'm, going to pre I'm not going to stop preaching my message. Hey, these guys all left. You guys want to go too? And if I know in my heart I'm preaching truth, which... To the point, I don't know of anything where I'm not. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be preaching it. But I'm going I'm to have the same type of an attitude in using Jesus as the example. If people start leaving the church because of some doctrine or something I preach that I think is right, you know what? I'll preach to just my family. I've done it before. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Because if, if my concern is being right with God, and you know what? That should be your concern too everybody's concern is your dedication is to Christ. It's not to a man. It's not to anyone else. It's not to your wife. Your dedication is first and foremost to Christ. That's who you are a disciple of. We need to understand things won't always go as expected. I'm sure there are people that started coming to this church and might have had different expectations of what it would be like. Right before the church actually existed, people were thinking like, oh man, this is great. Because all they're ever used to is just seeing maybe certain sermons online or whatever. And it might have built up something in their head of what, what's the church actually going to be like. Maybe it wasn't quite as exciting as you thought. Maybe, it was, you know, something different happened. It's not quite living up to your expectations. Maybe they got offended. Or maybe these people just don't even count the cost. Things aren't always going to go as expected. But... I'll tell you what, you know, some people may leave because they don't like me or they'll find some fault with me. And I, I've never claimed to be perfect. And if you want to look hard enough, I'm sure you'll find plenty of things that are wrong with me. There's no, there's no, um, you know, if that's what you want to do, then, then go ahead. Because I'm far from perfect. I have my own sins, my own problems. Okay. But I'm not here to ask you to be my disciple. I'm not here to gain a gathering and a crowd and a multitude after me. I want to help you become disciples of Jesus. That's my job. That's what I want to do. It's not, it's not about me. It's not about a man. It's not about any one man other than Jesus Christ. And the extent that you should follow me is the extent that I follow Christ. The pastor should be a good example. That's part of the job of being a pastor is someone that can lead by example. And the only, the extent that I want you to follow what I do is just the extent that, is that I'm right with God and, and following him. That's it. And it should be no more than that. But so if you have the right mindset on being a disciple of Christ, if there's ever a point where a man fails... That shouldn't offend you to the point of getting out of serving Christ because some man fails. Because you're only following a man until they stop following Christ. And then you say, well, you know what? They stopped, but I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep pushing forward because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm not a disciple of any, any other person. Turn if you go to John chapter 13. We need to make our discipleship known through our actions. John chapter 13, we're going to look at verse number 34. Paul says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So being a disciple of Jesus Christ means that you're going to love the brotherhood. You're not going to be having the contentions and the strives 
with other believers. You're going you're gonna to love one another. And the more that you show that, and the more, you know, people have a feeling. I've visited so many different churches, and all these different churches have all different feels to them. But when you walk into a church, hopefully people have this testimony of our church. I can't see how they wouldn't, of being friendly, warm, loving, hospitable, right? That's what a church should be. I've walked into other churches that felt the same way. Wow, I feel very welcome here. I feel at home with brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, and, and you know the churches I felt that the most are the ones that are doing the most. The ones that are following and, and being actual disciples of Jesus Christ that are going out and doing a lot of soul winning. Those are the churches where I felt that more than any other church. And I've visited quite a few churches, you know, and some are just kind of like, you kind of feel like you're an outcast. That they're not being good disciples of Jesus Christ because they, you, should, you should be able to walk in as, as, a, as a fellow brother or sister in Christ and, and see that love. And, and we should know that they're disciples because there's a love there for one another. But continuing on here, oh, we, we're, um, that was John 13. Flip over John 15. John 15. I got my notes really close together here. I almost... So our, our actions alone should show that we're disciples. By having that love one to another. Look at John chapter 15. Because another very important aspect of being a disciple is that you bear much fruit, that you're a soul winner. Look at verse number seven. The Bible says, if ye abide in me, is Jesus Christ speaking, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. He's saying God's glorified, the Father's glorified, when you bear much fruit, when you win a lot of people to Christ, when you're reproducing. And he says, and that's also how you're going to be my disciples. Because what was Jesus doing? He was going around and preaching the gospel. And he's saying, when you bear much fruit, that's how you will be my disciples. I'll read this for you in Mark, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 4. The Bible says in verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This is how you know if someone is following Jesus Christ, if they're a fisher of men. Now, if Jesus Christ says, hey, follow me, and if you're following me, then I will make you a fisher of men. Jesus Christ, his words cannot be broken. I mean, that's a truth coming out of his mouth. So if someone says they're following Jesus, but they're not a fisher of men... Are they really following Jesus Christ? No, of course not. Because Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. The mo if you truly are a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will win souls to Christ. You will be a fisher of men because that's what it's all about. That's what it is all about. You can't follow, say you're a follower of someone and just completely miss the point altogether. And just, no, nope, you know, I do everything else but lead people to Christ. You're not a follower of Christ then. At all. His whole ministry was about other people. The whole point was for him to come and to save other people from a damnation in hell. That was the purpose. And he's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people unto God. That is the point. If you're not doing that, you cannot say in good faith that you are a follower of Jesus. But I love the way that his disciples, and this is the reason why they were chosen to be his disciples and why they can be called disciples, because when he said, follow me and I will make you visions of men, they straightway left their nets and followed him. They were at work. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. They didn't say, well, hold on a minute. You know, my shift gets off in about an hour. Let me clock out, and then I'll come follow you. When Jesus called and he said, hey, I've got work for you to do. Come follow me. They dropped everything and said, I'll follow you. 
We're going right now. Let's do this. And that's why, and you know what? That mindset is why they stayed with him when the multitudes, when the larger gatherings left. Because it's going to be easy. And keep this in mind too. If there's ever a church split or a departure, that is the easiest time when you're not settled in your mind to just to leave, to get out. When there's other people doing it too, when there's multitudes against, or when there's multitudes against maybe me as a pastor, maybe someone finds some of the things that I've said that I'm you know, posting publicly, but someone finds fault at it, and then you're going to have the whole media storm, and everyone's against the church. Those are going to be the times when it's going to be the easiest for people who are not, have not, that, that have not counted the cost to slip out and to go away. When Jesus was arrested and was actually taken by force, that was the moment when the disciples had all said, I'll never betray you. I'm with you all the way. That was the moment when push came to shove when they all did forsake him. We need to be aware of that cost. We're no better than the disciples. We're no better than anyone else. We see these things that have happened. We need to be grounded and solid and unwavering in our faith and dedicated to serving Christ and being a disciple and not letting anything shake us from following and doing what he has for us. Let's keep reading here in John 15, verse number 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. I was just talking about keeping God's commandments, being that disciple, continuing in his love by obeying, by being obedient. Again, nothing to do with salvation. It has to do all, everything to do with being a disciple, being a follower. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus did. And greater love hath no man than this. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And this is his commandment saying, well, I want you to love one another. If you're going to be like me, then you need to love other people. And, and you cannot have a greater love than willing to sacrifice yourself. It's a self-sacrificial love. That's how you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We ought to love one another. To be willing to sacrifice of your own to help other people out. That is going to be another evidence that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. When you can have that mindset and not say, me first. You say, them first. Imagine if Jesus said, me first. <laughs> We'd all be doomed. But he didn't. He said, them first. And that's the example he left for us. Other people first. Put them first. Be a minister. Last place we'll look at, John chapter 12. Last passage. John 12, verse number 24. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. If we're going to be a, a, I mean, think about this. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, we understand the cost. We know we need to endure. We need to endure hard preaching. We need to endure persecutions, afflictions, tribulations. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he says, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? You're going to be right with Jesus. Is there any other place that you'd rather be than as close as you possibly can be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Now, you're not physically going to see him with your eyes on this earth while we're, while we're walking around day to day and while you're trying to obey and be a good disciple of Jesus Christ. 
but you can know through the lens of faith that if you are being that servant, you're right there with him. He's right there with you. And that should be a comfort in and of itself. No matter what's going on, what craziness happens, what kind of attacks and persecutions are coming, you maintain loyal to Christ. He is right there with you. And then not only that, he says, and if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Could you imagine receiving honor? From the, I mean, we're sinners. We don't even deserve to be saved. God gives us a free gift. But not only that, on top of that, he's going to give us honor. Wow. What a good God. What a great God to not only save our souls, but to bestow honor on us. And if God's going to bestow honor, what does that look like? What a, what a, what a great thing to ponder and a great motivation for deciding I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a servant of Jesus. I am going to do this with my life, and he is going to be my Lord because he saved me, because he's good, and because I just want to do what's right, and I want to learn and understand and grow and know more. Let's strive to be disciples. Don't let anything come in between you and our Savior. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much, so much for being such a merciful, long-suffering, loving God and for giving us not only the free gift of salvation, but just offering up so much, even more to us, that we could receive rewards and that, that you would give us things that really is only our reasonable service just to, to basically give our entire lives to serve you would be reasonable for us to do. But on top of that, Lord, you decided that you would actually bless us and honor us and, and give us rewards. God, thank you for that. Help us to remember these things. Help us not to become, you know, wavering or wishy-washy, Lord, or that we would get offended, especially through your word. Lord, help us to stay humble. Help us to have the love that puts other people first. I pray that you would please build this church, strengthen this church. Lord, those that, that aren't here right now, God, I pray that you please work in their hearts. And that if they're, you know, I pray that they're going somewhere where they can be a servant still and they haven't stopped serving you. Uh, just because they're not here, Lord, I pray that you would please just, um, just use them and work through them and, and help Help all of us, Lord, to just maintain our fidelity to you and that we would um, reflect that in our decision-making. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.